want to thank everyone for being here. Let me pull up. We've got, I got some notes that I wanted to I'm getting to an echo with. on audio. Are you getting an echo? Uh, tried to prevent that with this device. So we're going to figure out some things like that. Um, so I hope, I'm actually not sure what button to press to make that better. So uh, forgive if there's audio, I will, um, I will mute while speakers are speaking. This session is brought to you by generous support from sponsors, the Gerald Huff Fund for Humanity, Humanity Forward Foundation, Aid Kit, and Study. We thank them. Um, if you'd like to submit a question to speakers, please post in the Ask a Question section. There's a chat box where you can hold side conversations. Just understand I am not reading those as we go, but other participants are, and our speakers are also likely not seeing those as we go. Ask a question we will look at uh, when we get to the question period. Um, a format we've chosen is 10 minutes for Carl, then 10 minutes where Carl deals with questions, 10 minutes for Alex, then 10 minutes where we deal with questions. Um, and then we uh, let y'all go and uh, let you see some of our other uh, well, things that are coming up at noon. So we're moving, at well, noon my time, noon my time. All right, so again, thank you everybody. Um, later, by the way, Rashida Tlaib is presenting um, at noon. Um, I will have to have some understanding. She's probably received a thousand inv uh, invitations to protests and media appearances. Um, if we see her today, I'll be extremely grateful, um, but Anyway, that's a high octane, um, in my opinion, high octane guest that we have coming up next. All right, so let me let Carl in and let me introduce who we have speaking. Carl Weiderkist, professor at Georgetown University, Qatar. He's a co-founder of U.S. Basic Income Guarantee Network. He served as co-chair of Basic Income Earth Network. Um, his books and writings um, have done a lot for me as a political philosopher to frame uh, the issue of freedom and how it actually applies on the ground. Uh, Alex Howlett works with uh, Gresham. Uh, he also organizes the Boston Basic Income Roundtable, which I was invited to speak in, and it is outstanding. It, they pick a text that's relevant, folks get in there and there's just all kinds of voices that are in there that have worked with it. And, um, yeah, it was great, but we're not, we're not doing it anymore. Oh, darn it. Well, yeah. it was great. And we want you to do it. Well, if anyone wants to do something like that again, I want them to get a hold of you and get that back in play. Appreciate it. Uh, we did not, uh, through email or any means, uh, decide to wear the same shirts for the session. <laughs> that was not a thing that happened that was entirely mm -hmm. coincidental all right Carl, I just the right. Looks like we have three heads yeah i know it we look like we're, yeah. we're the cerebrus of basic income um, political yeah. philosophy and economic theory um carl i hand it to you if you see me looking i'm not on my phone i'm just using my timer and we'll do 10 minutes i'll let you know you can wrap up and then we'll have questions all right so okay go. great so I believe that when you argue about basic income, you can talk about all kinds of things about how it works, what's going to happen, what's going to be, what, what, are, what are the effects are. But one of its known effects um, is one of the most controversial. And some people will often try to use that as a trump card against, uh, against, um, against the idea of a basic income. The trump card that, well, Everybody has to work, um, they will say. And you can't ignore that issue. It's an, it's an ethical issue uh, of whether everyone has to work um, and whether everyone does work and everyone should work and everyone will work without basic income. You can't ignore that issue. And my belief is that the best defense is a good offense, is that is that you want to attack this idea of, 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 of um, that everyone should work, that there's something good about a society where everyone works. And so this paper that I'm talking about here, I don't have time to present the whole thing. Um, it's 
very short presentation is more or less an advertisement for the paper, which is a draft chapter of what will be my book, Basic Income Essential Knowledge, that's going to be coming out hopefully later this year. The draft chapter, it's a little advertisement for you to read this draft chapter and give me some feedback, is that the best defense is a good offense, is that I don't think basic income advocates really get anywhere by ignoring this issue or by saying, oh, look, we did a basic income trial and people still work. Well, if you're going to conceive the idea that it's a bad thing when the lower class works less, then basic income is not the best policy if that's our position. In order to make the case that basic income is the best way, to, we have to attack this idea of mandatory participation rather than playing defense. This idea that everybody has to work needs to be attacked. And I, so I attack that in a number of ways in this chapter in the book. In the book, I start talking about how much we would hate it if somebody came into the room right now and sucked all the air out of the room and said, this is my property. I'm going to improve this air. I'm going to take all the pollutants out of it. You're going to love it. You're going to love the new air, but you got to work for me in order to get this air back. Um, I think we'd all really hate that. We'd want to be compensated for the air that we lost. If there was some benef benefit of privatizing the atmosphere. Well, if you're so, if you would be so upset if somebody privatized the atmosphere, why aren't you upset that someone has already privatized the water and the ground and really everything else, all the other resources you need to survive are owned by someone else who says you can't use these until you do what we tell you. And that gets me to the first thing on my list of 12 things of putting the mandatory participation on trial, the essential reason that I support basic income is because it's wrong to come between a person and the resources they need to survive, and that's exactly what we do. We create poverty and economic destitution, and we use it as a threat to get the lower class to do what more privileged people want them to do. And we need to own that. That's what we're, that is what we're doing, and we need to own that. And people will, will run from that. If you confront them with this is what we're doing, they will try to pretend that somehow we're not. They want to have it both ways that they want to have a mandatory participation where everyone must work, but oh no, we're not actually using a threat and force by hogging all the resources to get everybody to work. Well, yes, that is what we're doing and UBI is the cure in a modern economy with billions of people. Um, you got to confront people with that. And you get, we'll get some knee-jerk uh, knee -jerk criticisms like saying, oh, so you're against no, I am not against work. I am against forced labor. Being against forced labor is like being against forced sex. I am not against sex if I say I'm against rape. I'm against forced sex. I am not against labor if I say I'm against a mandatory participation economy. I am against forced labor. Forced labor with a choice of masters is better than chattel slavery, but it's still a form of false labor, forced labor, and it's still one that we do by creating this space of manufactured desperation. We manufacture desperation by taking all the resources and saying, a few people own these. Government controls some of them, and private, wealthy, big corporations own the rest of them. And you can't touch them unless you survive. And that puts all of us, not just the people at the bottom, but all of us in a state where we are stressed and worried because we have to keep working to keep our needs going. The state of manufactured desperation is not good for any of us. It. It's only good for people who, who, who own businesses and really like to pay low wages. It's not good for anyone else. And it's not good for the lower class, the middle class, well up into, the, in, into middle class workers who are making lots of money. The fact that they have to work hurts them if they had another alternative. And that's why I say when people say, well, what about incentives? Like, yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because the, the employers of the world have very little incentive to pay good wages and to pass on 
the profits they make in the form of wages. We need UBI and the power to refuse bad jobs on the part of workers to give employers the incentive to pay good wages, to offer good working conditions, to end sexual harassment and other forms of harassment on the job. UBI is fantastic for incentives. Of course, we'll say, well, that's not what I meant. About incentives, I meant what's the incentive to get people to work? The incentive to get people to work is good wages and good working conditions. Say everybody has their price. If you believe everybody has their price, pay them enough and they will do it. If you want me, if you, if you, you know, if you don't think, if you don't think you can get somebody to clean the toilets in your office, if we don't have basic income, well, I'll do it. Pay me, pay me more than I'm getting at my job at Georgetown University in Qatar. I will gladly come and I will, you know, you give me a better rate of pay. I will gladly come and clean your toilets. Uh, we need to have some sympathy and we need to have some respect for people who are saying, I'm not going to work because maybe, maybe the reason is that they're a lazy person. Maybe the reason is that they're cheap employers who are paying really bad wages, really bad jobs and bad wages. I deal with that. I deal with issues of work ethic. I deal with the question of reciprocity. People say, well, if you give, you've got to give back. We shouldn't be giving to people stuff for free. We already gave the resources to the people who own them. All the property in the world is made out of natural resources. When we split these up, we did not split them up. Most of us didn't get a share. That is not a reciprocal division of resources. We are not living up to the principle of reciprocity that if you're going to split things up, everybody should get a share unless we have basic income. Basic income makes up for this violation of the reciprocity principle that has been going on since we established the private property system in the enclosure movement and in the colonial movement just a few hundred years ago. I talk about exploitation. People will say that basic income allows non-workers to exploit workers. Well, it also allows workers to refuse exploitative jobs for their employer. Remember, that's when we originally talked about exploitation. That's what we talked about, workers being exploited by their employers. And the reason workers are vulnerable to exploitation is because they have nothing to sell but their labor. They have to go into the labor market and sell their labor or they will die. That is the root of that of employment, and then as soon a root of exploitation and employment, but then as soon as you free the worker to reject those exploitive jobs, then you're going to accuse those workers of, of who are refusing these exploitive jobs of being exploiters. It's as if you're never going to let the worker win. There is no exploitation in UBI because of the reciprocity issue I brought up. If somebody's paying you a UBI, it's because they have more resources than you do. People pay for the resources they get, they get paid for the resources that they don't have. You're paying for the resources you control, getting paid for the resources everybody else controls. That is reciprocity, and there's nothing exploitive about that. If you choose to live on that, that's fine. There's nothing exploitive. There's nothing to be exploited for, for gaining the system in UBI. If you don't want to work, somebody hasn't given you incentives, let them give you a better and that's why it's good for workers. And I also talk about what it does to, to women, the family, and children. I talk about the false promise of the conditional system. Conditional programs can never eliminate poverty because they need poverty. They use poverty as a work incentive to get everybody to work. There has to be a threat. If you want to have mandatory participation, you've got to threaten people with something pretty awful if they're not going to do it. Um, and I talk about this, people desire a circle, circle of obligation and a natural right to private property, and I address all of these issues in this paper. And so I hope you'll all uh, check it out uh, because I don't have time. To, I haven't even done a third of it in this talk. As that's for saying. And we may bring up in questions. Uh, you know what I mean? We're, we're likely to ask questions that lead to it. Now, the ask a question prompt, if you're online here, is at the bottom, and I, I'll actually open it in a minute. I'm going to come in with a question of my own. Let me set the timer so we don't um, yeah, squeeze into the next space. Um, you'll see me fiddling with that. 
Um, mm -hmm. Exploitation is an interesting topic. I've taught students about it. And there's a question I posed, Carl. It's a story you and I were at one of these basic income congresses, the NABIG in New York. And we were thinking about going to the Starlight Diner where Broadway, Broadway adjacent people trying to get into Broadway are singing while bringing in food. And I remember we looked at each other and said, uh, how do we know this is good? And how do we know we aren't waving money and making people dance and sing in front of us? <laughs> you know, and there's like, it really affected us. Like, you know, how do we know this, right? So we don't want to exploit someone's need. They go out there to pursue a dream and now they're here and we're like, you know, do the song you hate because I like it. And I posed that with students who really felt funny about this because a lot of them had gone. It was a nice question. It turned better than I thought it was. But a lot of them said, wait a minute, you know, they're mature, they're adults, they've agreed to work there, they've agreed the terms. It's not clearly embarrassing, right? So they questioned whether they thought they could know it's not exploitative, right, going in. Mm -hmm. I was trying to make that more problematic. And it sounds like you're dealing with, because they don't have a guaranteed package that secures their survival. I'm never going to know. Yeah. I'm, curious, I'm just and, running that by well, you. And it's true. It's, it's, it's true that in that sense, UBI does not eliminate exploitation. And we shouldn't pretend that it does. What it does is it gives you another option. Um, and for the worst jobs, I think that will eliminate the kind of exploitation we see in the worst jobs. Um, I've heard the worst job in the, in the country is, is to be a janitor at a meatpacking plant. It gets horrible pay, horrible health conditions, and great risk of injury. Um, and those kind of jobs I think people will run from for the UBI. But there are other kinds of jobs, uh, such as I think the thing that you're talking about, where uh, where people are doing it for another reason, because of their ambition. So you're not, so the lower end jobs are exploiting people's need to eat and have, and have uh, clothing and things like that. But the upper end jobs, they might be exploiting your ambition. You've dreamed all of your life of being an actor or a movie star. And I'm gonna exploit that, or, or well, I'm not going to, but Harvey Weinstein is gonna exploit that by making the only path to becoming a movie star is through having sex with him. That's rape and exploitation. And UBI will not eliminate that because what he's exploiting is not your need for food, but your, your ambition. Um, and uh, that we need, but I, I do think UBI will help if it helps create a climate where from the low end up, we are reporting people for things like this because we can. Uh, whereas what we're trying to do, we're trying to do Me Too from the, the top down or next to the top. We don't do the very top. We don't do it to Trump, but we do it to Harvey Weinstein, Bill Cosby. We start from the top down. That's not filtering down to the exploiters at the local restaurant um, who are using that, uh, who are using who are exploiting your most basic needs. It, I don't believe it's filtered down the Me Too level. Has it not? I think it would uh, be easier. Need, I think we'll more effectively filter up. If we I mean, I believe people, people will... will uh, form the organizations they need uh, that makes countering any kind of exploitation mm -hmm. easier, right? If there's if people mm -hmm. are developing their own forms of media yeah. and creativity, they might have an easier time saying no to a, a Weinstein. Mm -hmm. Let's pull up the ask a question. I'm going to read it out loud. Um, Sid Frankel is asking what we think of the well, this is a question about jobs guarantee, modern monetary theory, jobs guarantee. And Alex, I'll throw that at you mm -hmm. later too. But let's let me throw at you then the jobs guarantee, right? Which comes up now and then in the work we do. How wouldn't a jobs guarantee offer you an exit, one bad employer? I'll know that I'm guaranteed another job. So I can say no to one employer and because I know I can say yes to another. Well, you still have a situation where a less privileged, with, with a job guarantee, you have, well, there's, there's two problems. One is, um, one is you still have a situation where it is the lower class 
the less privileged people in society that have to work for more privileged people, and the more privileged people decide how many hours must they work, what working conditions do they work under, who's their boss. Um, it is, it is, you're always trying to get these less privileged people to prove that they deserve it from the, from the upper class people when the things are the other way around. Those with privilege should be asking those without, how can I justify my privileges? What can I do for you? Like pay you a basic income to justify my privileges. You give people to, you, you need people to be able to opt out of everything, including the so-called guaranteed job. And then there's the problem with the guaranteed job. Either it's not really guaranteed or it's not really a job. Because you can, and, the, and the, the guaranteed job, the way they conceive it, as well as for everybody who really will do what they told. So you can get fired from your guaranteed job and then be out on the street. So they are still using homelessness as a threat to get, get the lower class to do what more privileged people want them to do. It doesn't solve the problem. Now, if you have UBI and then you add a, a guaranteed job on, on top of it so that people have an opt-out, options in the guaranteed job. I got nothing against it. Um, but it doesn't solve the problem I'm talking about. Mandatory participation for a government boss can be just as bad as mandatory participation for a private boss. I mean, I think we're, um, there was a period when we were starting with basic income. Um, well, this was a while ago when a group that was pushing jobs guarantee had a very hard it was a false dilemma like they were demanding mm -hmm. you've got to choose between job guarantee and basic income and i've always wondered about that because as you phase things in mm -hmm. mass hiring seems fine and you can have cash grants mm -hmm. as well right mm -hmm. you know the i don't know i just always felt like it was a false dilemma that was being insisted on by mm -hmm. a small number. so there's people who are new mm -hmm. to the issue wonder why there's some sort of conflict yeah. between this but in your case there is if someone says jobs guarantee and no basic income that's what i want mm -hmm. then your point about mandatory participation yeah. is very strong it's right there in yeah. the middle of that and if you want you know if your idea is a job guarantee um and you're against basic income you will have homeless you are you need homeless you will need homelessness to exist in order to get people to do what they're told on their guaranteed jobs, because people will test your limits. And if it's really a guaranteed job where I can't get fired and you're never ever going to make me homeless, people will test those limits and they will do nothing on the job. And there are countries that do this. Qatar does this. Um, where I where I live, they've got a lot of they um, they've got a lot of really nice jobs for for Qatari citizens, uh, and not all of them are real jobs. Some people are going in and loafing all day. Which would infuriate, I mean, I, I can't think of something more likely to generate bad narrative stories about trying to answer poverty, right, than, than that in the United States. Okay, I've been asked to mute when I'm not speaking. You couldn't hear the background noise, but people on the people, people like giving the comments can't. So I'll mute yeah, they're around. talking about it. Yeah, I can hear it, but I can hear you as well. But yeah, Carl, we'll have you mute, and if questions come your way, we'll bring you right back in. So sounds good. Alex, I want to have you present. Uh, you've also, uh, in fact, it segs right into your topic, right? The uh, job guarantee and the dangers you see in it. Looking forward to it. Yeah, straight up, I'm going to say that I am one of these people who see like a stark dichotomy between uh, basic income and job guarantee. And I do think they directly conflict with each other. Um, and I think any amount of job guarantee is a mistake. So I'll start with that. Um, this paper is uh, a work in progress. It's called The Mistake of Full Employment. It's not done. I've shared the latest per, uh, version in the chat. If you scroll all the way up to the, the, to the top, you'll see it there. Um, it's newer than the version that's linked in the event info. So even so, the paper is still rough, and I'm open to feedback uh, from anyone. Uh, it's seven pages long right now, but I think it could be shorter because I'm trying to make a very simple point. Uh, at least I feel uh, that it's simple. Um, it feels like a point that should be obvious, yet it's not something that's obvious. Uh, it's not something that a lot of people seem to understand. The point is just this, is that full employment or maximum employment as a policy goal is bad for people, bad for the economy, bad for society. It's just bad. Okay, so what do I mean by that? 
what could be wrong with allowing everyone to contribute to society through a useful, meaningful, well-paid job? Uh, framed in this way, full employment sounds like a no-brainer. Am I against allocating people's time and effort towards sustaining maximum human prosperity? Of course not. Uh, if we define full employment as the optimal allocation of people's time and effort, then it's actually not bad. It's good. It's great. Uh, but that's not usually what people mean by full employment. They might assume full employment brings optimal al labor allocation, but that's not part of the definition of full employment. Instead, they tend to talk about getting everyone a job who wants one, or at least getting as many people jobs as possible, something like that. I point out in the paper that yes, the benefits of employing people in jobs can sometimes outweigh the costs, but not always. The problem is that paying people to do one thing necessarily prevents them from doing something else. By assuming that more jobs and higher wages are unequivocally good for society and the economy, we ignore this opportunity cost of labor. As a result, we risk over-employing people and wasting their time on comparatively unproductive and unfulfilling activities. It matters what kinds of things people are and are not working on, right? Um, it matters how they spend their time. I argue that giving people a source of money independent from jobs allows us to drop the full employment paradigm, eliminate make work, and allocate labor more effectively. Make work? What make work? Well, full employment policy is make work policy. When we structure our economy for people to earn their money exclusively through jobs, we bias the allocation of people's time and effort toward paid work. Work is important for what it produces. There will always be useful work for people to do, and we will always have reasons to pay people to spend their time on certain activities. Work, both paid and unpaid, is a necessary, fundamental, and unavoidable fact of life. Work is also important to the people who do the work. Either it feels subjectively important, or the money it pays makes it important. If work weren't important to the worker, it wouldn't get done. It just wouldn't. We pay people to do work they wouldn't otherwise do. Fine. Okay. But that means that to the extent that we pay people to work, we predicate their access to the economy's product on the labor they perform. People who receive more wages can buy more stuff. The promise of the stuff is the reward that motivates the work. Now, in terms of allocating people's time and effort, we can try to imagine a world where everybody is self-sufficient. Each person allocates their personal time and effort to the tasks needed to sustain their own survival. Everybody does every kind of work, that kind of thing. Uh, this is unrealistic. In the real world, we specialize. Generally, a small number of people perform all of a particular type of work for their community. Whenever specialization is more efficient, self-sufficiency is less efficient. Specialization allows society as a whole to achieve more benefit from less effort less labor. Although specialization saves labor, it also forces us all to become interdependent. In a specialized economy, everybody depends, at least partly, on the product of other people's work. If specialization evenly distributed its labor savings, then everyone would continue to contribute labor in the same proportion as before. Each individual person would still have something to trade for what they want and need. But it would be weird if specialization saved, for example, exactly 90% of each individual person's labor. Nevertheless, <laughs> each person still needs a way to access things they don't make for themselves. You can see where I'm going with this. But let's get back to the question of full employment. There is a sense in which every person is always fully employed. They each spend 24 hours every day doing something. There is also a sense in which nobody is ever fully employed. People would always be happy to receive more money for their time. But none of, this, none of this tells us how well we're allocating people's time. According to our conventional definition of employment, whether we consider a person unemployed is a function of whether that person wants or has a paid job. People who don't want jobs are not unemployed. If everyone who wanted a job had one, we could declare the economy to be at full employment. This definition of full employment suggests two possible ways of achieving full employment. Either give everyone a job who wants one, or ensure that people without jobs have no desire for jobs. When we choose to provide jobs rather than alleviating the underlying need for wages, we are forcing people to work for their money. Of course, I mean, this is what Carl's talking about, right? But of course, forcing people to work is not always a bad thing. Hiring people into jobs can be worthwhile whenever society benefits from those people spending their time in that way. Okay, but what is a job? 
when we're employing people in jobs, what are we even actually talking about? Well, there are a lot of different ways to characterize how people spend their time. For example, a person can pay or be paid any amount of money to spend any amount of their time on any number of different kinds of activities while exerting any le level of effort. Job is a label that draws a binary distinction between labor time and non-labor time. What counts as a job is determined by arbitrary cutoff points for wage levels, hours worked, effort exerted, etc. The job concept allows us to sort people into two categories, those whose time is allocated according to an arbitrary minimum standard of employment and those whose time is not. A job is an observable, discrete quantum of employment. You either have a job or you don't. You're either at work or you're not. But productivity isn't like that. Productivity is a continuum, not a binary condition that we can neatly encapsulate into the concept of a job. The term job, instead of just helping us describe how the economy does work, also gives us a prescription for how the economy should work and imposes a constraint on how the economy can work. And it constrains the levers we can use to influence incentives in the economy. The more money people receive outside of a job, the less incentive they have to earn money through a job. If society needs people to work more, we can reduce the level of comfort enjoyed by the jobless and vice versa, right? Pretty straightforward. Incentives influence how people spend their time. And not all incentives are even monetary. Evolution has hardwired certain incentives into human biology, such as the incentives to eat, breathe, sleep, reproduce, etc. Social learning has wired other incentives into human culture, such as those associated with morality, justice, rights, and even work ethic. When biology and social rewards are insufficient motivators, that's when we have to pay people to do the work. Wages as a source of money are inherently coercive. Think about that. Wages as a source of money are inherently coercive. They change people's behavior. The less access people have to non-wage money sources, the more wage-based coercion they must endure. Despite cultural norms around the importance of having a job, people don't naturally desire jobs. That's why we have to pay them to work in the first place. People want the compensation that jobs provide. Wages are compensation for something that would ordinarily be undesirable. But don't people need to contribute in order to feel a sense of meaning and purpose? Sure, but that comes from incentives too. When work feels intrinsically meaningful to us, we are better workers. Belief in the intrinsic value of hard work helps us survive in a society that predicates our survival on having a job. Our survival depends on us accepting norms around paid work and internalizing them into our own psychology. The need for a job feels innate. It's supposed to. Ideally, we should want to ensure that people feel a sense of meaning, purpose, and dignity in their lives. And this can feel impossible to do in a job-oriented culture without giving everyone a way to contribute, quote unquote, through paid employment. Luckily, culture is adaptable. As our economy changes, our culture can change to match. What we really don't want is for our cultural beliefs to stand in the way of social prosperity. Think about technology. In a world where people need the money from wages, technological progress can't save labor without reducing people's incomes. This is you know, common basic income argument. Rather than harmlessly freeing our, so our society from unnecessary toil, technology becomes a threat to people's precious jobs. We fear an economy that no longer needs us. And we re we've responded by using economic policy to try to ensure that people can earn their living through jobs. Full employment policy continually neutralizes many of the labor-saving effects of technological advancement. It's make work, an economy that requires people to earn their money through jobs. In an economy that requires people to earn their money through jobs, the only way to ensure that people have money is to get them jobs. Employers, of course, are not out of the kindness of their hearts going to hire workers when it's not profitable to do so. So we use economic policy to make it profitable. The make work hides behind market incentives. What's counterintuitive and even ironic is that this unproductive make work actually does contribute to economic output, but it contributes through demand, not supply. The wages from the jobs give people money to buy stuff, which helps prevent a demand shortfall. Even if the jobs are completely useless, the money they give people is not. Our society tends to treat labor allocation and money distribution as the same problem. We assume that bringing the economy to full employment optimizes for both, but it optimizes for neither. The status quo is that we force people to work as an excuse to pay them. We are handing out money by handing out jobs. Ideally, wages would be low enough 
to prevent undesired coercion. Instead of artificially inflating wages, we would hand people the rest of their money directly. Direct cash eliminates make work. If we ever find ourselves employing people or paying wages for any reason other than the product of the labor, we know that the labor market is less efficient than it could be. We can always improve labor allocation by eliminating make work. Part of this whole work ethic, make work, full employment culture we have going on is that we idolize workers and fetishize labor. But people are always people. They're not always workers employed at jobs. If we optimize our economy for the benefit of workers, that needlessly forces people to become workers. During the Great Depression, John Maynard Keynes diagnosed involuntary unemployment as the root of our economy's ills. Since then, the macroeconomic policy goal of full employment has rarely been questioned. Economists assume that as long as nothing impedes labor productivity, full employment allows the economy to operate at its full potential. And maybe that's true. But full employment policy undermines the very assumption on which it depends. Make work impedes the labor productivity it is meant to take advantage of. When policymakers aim for full employment, even if they believe otherwise, they are not optimizing the allocation of people's time and effort. Instead, they are ensuring that people have jobs, a type of paid work with arbitrarily defined parameters. Was the problem during the Great Depression really that people didn't have enough jobs? Or was it that people didn't have the money to buy what the economy was capable of producing for them? People need things that, in our culture, only a job can provide. So when activists ask for higher wages and better employee benefits, they're expressing a need for people to have better access to money and other services. They frame their demands in terms of jobs because they don't see an alternative. Job independent benefits, including direct cash and universal health care, give us an alternative to make work. They allow the labor market to pay wages only as an incentive. Instead of wasting people's time, we can pay for work only when we want the product. Can we ever truly know whether people's time and effort are being allocated optimally? Maybe not. But we can know, and this is important, we can know that creating jobs and boosting wages for the benefit of workers is never optimal we can know that full employment is a mistake. And that's, that's my talk. Carl, do you have a question? Oh, you're muted. Okay, uh, uh, Jason, you're muted. We cannot hear you. Good Lord Almighty, thank you. Yeah. All right, so I think I'll come in with a no question, hand, Carl. Yeah. I see that you have one, and then I'll use the ask a question as folks come in. I guess more of a comment. I, I, had, oh, I had often been saying for a while this um, full employment versus basic income false dilemma. And if we just understand mass hiring, that's going to be the – and mass hiring is fine. Um, if we just understand that then uh, there's no need to have this kind of debate. But Alex, I'm just pointing out, you're 100% addressing the idea that what we need right now, if, if I believe what we need right now is mass hiring, then the concerns you raise are gonna be uh, central right away. I didn't phrase it as a question, but uh, does that sound right? Yeah, I mean, mass hiring is fine as long as you're doing it for the product of the labor. And it doesn't have to be that the workers are producing something right now. It could be that you want to build uh, or maintain labor capacity or something like that. Uh, if you're doing it for the supply that it creates, uh, then it's fine. But if you're doing it kind of like, oh, we need to make workers better off or we need to, you know, people need jobs and we want to help the people, that's, that's a, a backwards way to help the people is to give them jobs. So for the product, fine, as a for the people as a project, right? An end goal of government, um, bad. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we want the government to benefit the people, and if your goal is to give them access to the economy's output, then you can hand them money. You really only need to tie that money to a condition like a job um, if you need the incentive effect. Thank you, Carl. I'll invite you in, and then I'll start looking at ask a question. Feel free to come in anytime on that. Okay, great. Um, I uh, I agree with uh, with pretty much everything you said, um, but there's something that you left out um, that that I think you can't possibly answer 
in the 10 minutes that we have left. So you think maybe all you can do is just allude to some other planned or previous research or something, but you, you didn't really address the Keynesian problem. Um, that you uh, said, well, um, you, you don't, the Keynesian problem is that, that people, there are people who are willing that the economy tends to produce a situation. There are people who are willing and able to work at the going wage, but can't find a job because employers aren't hiring, and, but employers would hire them if they had the money and people were buying the product. And that, that the solution of, well, if we took unemployment, uh, if there's this tendency in the economy, it gets worse at some points during recessions, it gets a little better at other, but it tends to the economy. The, the idea of just reducing how much people want to work would get us to full employment if the number of jobs available doesn't change. But if the Keynesian problem exists, then you're just going to get, you're going to get more unemployment at a higher level. If there is true Keynesian unemployment, where there are people who are willing and able to work at the going wage and people who would employ them to do things if, if, if their business was making the money they would make if they could sell these goods. If that problem really exists, you do not need to make work to eliminate unemployment. Um, so it is very possible that you can have basic income and you still get a more efficient economy if you have some program that takes up the slack in the labor market because of this Keynesian problem. If the Keynesian problem is real and, and exists and it's been studied, of course, uh, since the Great Depression. Yeah, and so, so, so now, really quickly, um, I would reframe the Keynesian problem. Um, you know, he kind of frames it as a problem of um, workers going unemployed or resources going unemployed. And I would say that, that it, it kind of maps onto a problem of the economy underperforming in terms of the product that it produces for people. Um, so you can solve that problem by giving people money so they can buy stuff. And that naturally, you know, props up demand and, you know, helps businesses and, and helps workers and stuff like that. But businesses and workers, they're not, you know, like who we care about. We care about people. Businesses and workers are, are producers and they only exist to kind of serve the people. So when we think of the economy as like, okay, we want to stimulate businesses or something like that, then you end up kind of having a, a policy objective. Um, a, a target that that doesn't necessarily map directly onto what we want from the economy. So this is good Hart's law, right? When a measure becomes a target, it ceases to be a good measure. So if we're measuring the economy by how employed our resources are, and then we just target resource employment, then that's not a very good measure of how, how the economy is performing anymore. Whereas if we give people money directly and give them access to what the economy can produce, then it naturally activates resources as needed. It naturally activates labor as needed. I want to go to uh, some of the questions that are uh, coming in. Um, one, Eddie Chu's uh, asks, does UBI increase labor demand, uh, including simultaneous policy adjustments? Sid Frankel uh, threw out modern monetary theory. So if either of you bite on that, that's fine. I'm going to zero in on, um, actually, Sid Frankel came up with a second question that I think we need to have a panel on or start having some panels on. Um, Marx's solution to exploitation is collective ownership of the means of production by the proletariat. I would just like a panel where we bring in that language, that architecture, you know, address those. But again, that's up to you if you want to bite on that. And then Carrie Neal, I'm just going to read hers because I think it fits really strongly. Interesting your take on the reference of jobs, the idea that people should be grateful to have one. Here in Newfoundland and Labrador, for example, the government justifies doing damaging things, exploring for oil, building hydrogens, and these damaging things are justified because they will create jobs. So it's not about the product of the labor. Uh, the product we're getting is ecological damage. She didn't say, but also electricity power, but ecological damage is one of the main products. But people are told to be grateful for the jobs, and it's deeply entrenched. And if she sees damage in uh, jobulism, uh, that goes into things like ecological damage. So I'll throw those your way. Yeah, I, I would say that's exactly right. And this is this is kind of the perverse pathological, um, you know, uh, cultural, um, you know, uh, situation uh, that I'm complaining about for my paper, essentially, and that I'm saying we, we shouldn't have. You know, like 
sometimes it's useful to to drill for energy and there's there's trade-offs right you you get the energy but then you damage the environment but employing people is a cost not a benefit we should never put that on the on the on the plus column right that's that's a cost so you see so, so if you if we are doing things more than we otherwise would for the benefit of employing people uh, if we stop seeing that as a benefit then we're going to do less of that stuff I grew up um, in our South Arkansas and the town next to us had a paper mill and we just it smelled horrible and that's you know we didn't drive in didn't uh, you know wasn't you didn't go to a restaurant there and nobody who lived there was allowed to say this smells horrible if you said uh they would come down on you hard and they'd say it smells like bread and butter right so even if you didn't get the job you were supposed to um say something uh like a paper mill smells good right which I guess I'm adding perversity to perversity. Um, and I, I should just add, I mentioned this a little bit in my talk, but there are reasons why we have this kind of pro-labor work ethic, you know, belief in, you know, idolization of workers, that kind of thing. It's because it is compatible with a certain set of incentives. If you're living in a world where you actually do need jobs or you need people to contribute or, or people's survival depends on having a job, then it's useful for your own survival to believe in the importance of having a job because it makes you a better worker. Let's see, I'm trying to, um, yeah, yeah. I mean, so you're right. So uh, in some of the stuff I read philosophically at the Frankfurt School, um, we're asked to think about uh, that we're not just, um, we don't just see pricing as the only motivation, right? We're actually trying to create a set of desires, we, right? So it could be um, the public relations trying to create a customer that desires something they didn't desire before the ad campaign, uh, but also creating um, a worker that values work is also seen as kind of an ideological um, perversion. I worry a little bit about the direct confrontation of that. Um, I guess there's two things that are going to come up if we take this, you know, to Peoria. Um, a lot of work out there needs to be done. So if we get rid of jobs as the central focus, I think we can concede that pretty easily. We could use a lot of nurses, a lot of teachers, really tiny classrooms would be great. Um, daycare, healthcare, child, you know, just a lot of jobs if we could, um, increase those numbers by a large amount, um, or at least whoever wants them could have them. I think uh, we could be happy for a while. Um, so that's one point we're gonna hear, a lot of hiring to do. Um, but I think the other is uh, recognizing people who get up, go to work, kind of recognizing them as contributing. There's just a lot of cultural work that goes into that, like a lot of country yeah. music songs about getting up, doing the job um, but, and recognizing that that's the stuff that we use later. Yeah. Um, and I don't, I don't want to lose and shove it, says, uh, David Allen. Johnny Paycheck, yeah, Johnny Paycheck's take its job and shove it is another country music song. But, David Allen Co. is the original and of uh, uh, Thank you. All right. Correcting the Arkansan and country. Cassopolis can correct the Arkansan and country music. The um, Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah. Just Alex, I'm curious your reaction. I, I don't want to lose that notion that you know you're contributing if people have hired. I don't want to lose it. I don't know. I want to I want to keep something of it. Hey, yeah. you, you know, you're doing. Well, you're, you're, you know being you're OK. Paid. You're being what? paid. That's your compensation. Um, if you feel like you're contributing, you know, that's another form of compensation. Like, oh, I get this, you know, like psychological reward from doing the work. This is all part of the incentive mechanism, right? And the incentive mechanism is all out of whack because a lot of the jobs today, a lot of the work that people are doing is not contributing, even though we kind of uh, sell it as that. We sell it as, oh, if you're working, I mean, there's a set, there's always a sense in which you are contributing if you have a job. That's the sense in which you're bringing money back home to your family and you're contributing to your family. 
That does not mean that you're contributing to the economy. But these things kind of get mixed up with each other too. We have the large scale market context in which it's all a bunch of make work, or not all of it, but there's a lot of make work. And then we have the kind of the family context where you're going and participating in this broken system and doing something to benefit your family. And of course that's honorable, that's, you know, that's beneficial and, and you should feel good about, uh, about doing that, uh, about getting the most out of our broken system or whatever. Um, but that's not, you know, kind of the narrative that we tell because, you know, we have to kind of believe that um, it makes us better workers to believe that we actually are contributing uh, to the economy. Um, so I, you know, I think we, you know, it's, it's going to be a big cultural shift to get away from this kind of, this kind of workism. If you have a job, you're, you, you know, you're somehow honorable or something like that. Um, and it, yeah, it's, it's, it's not, it's not an easy transition, but the first step is to really understand kind of what's going on with the economy. What's going on with incentives? Why do we employ, why is there such a thing as a job? Why do we employ people and really kind of, um, you know, employing people, shifting shifting our our economic policy so that we're we're employing people really for for the benefit of the output for for the product of the labor. Um, it's hard to do that if you don't have something like a basic income. If you don't have a, a mechanism for distributing money and other benefits like healthcare that's independent from jobs. I want to acknowledge Gary Neal's point she's making. Um, if y'all get a chance to look at that, because. It is true, the idea that if you're paid to do a job, now you know you're contributing. Good God, so much essential work is unpaid, right? And a lot of that has been uh, dictated by race. And absolutely, you do not know you're contributing if you're, if you're doing a paid job. Right. You and you, are, you do. you're doing, if you've paid a job, that means you have served the whims of the people who own property. You can serve their whims by doing a lot of horrible, destructive stuff. And very often that's what that's what we end up doing. Um, and and what I've been okay, I'll go take go back. I think it's useful to keep in mind that there's a lot of important work that's not getting done in our society, and that includes both paid and unpaid work. And if we get the incentives right, then that can allow us to be collectively more productive, and also to you know there's. To, to spend our time in ways that are that are more meaningful and beneficial to us as individuals. I just think about a trope in um, pop culture where we see the the you know was a philosophy major in college and now he or she is a barista and that's always the starting point where we've got to get out of that, right? Yeah. And then they either end up finding vampires, alien, you know, there's something that comes in that kind of takes this meaningless uh, situation and turns it meaningful. Carl, and are you I've trying to show us the barista? That. What? Is Carl trying to show us the barista? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, someone's uh, pointing out, uh, someone's saying I've done more with my unpaid life and have harmed more in what I'm getting paid for. And someone's saying right on. So yeah, yeah the barista no, waiting. A lot of... Well, um, I tell you what. I wanna, I wanna can get... I quickly respond to yeah, Eddie's please. point about labor demand? Yes, so go ahead. the question is, does basic income increase labor demand? Sometimes you hear the story about, okay, people are spending more money and businesses have more income then that creates more jobs, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that is not the story that I would tell. The story that I would tell is that we are artificially propping up labor demand to give people jobs. Um, and that's kind of a consequence of the labor mechanism that we're using to push money to people through wages. If we use a basic income instead of that, then the source of demand is going to be more efficient. And you might even have less demand. Um, if you if, so, if you if you just add a basic income to the economy, that's not going to work. It's like, what are you doing it, it instead of? If you're doing it instead of kind of keeping interest rates low to stimulate the financial sector to create jobs, um, then yeah, you might end up having less labor demand um, in in a basic income system. The um, well, I think about a neighbor. You know, a lot of towns like that town with the um, paper mill, where very little the folks who work there were not generating a lot of demand. Like people weren't opening restaurant shops and, you know, there just weren't a lot of people showing up and hiring. So they had to drive to a grocery store in another town, things like that. So I'm hoping basic income, I always hope generates a kind of markets where currently if you have a million dollars, you and I wouldn't go there and open up, but because we tend to open up where there's lots of people who are spending uh, yeah. money. But remember yeah. that the goal isn't to support businesses. The goal isn't to open up markets. It's not even to support workers. The goal is to have an economy that provides people the things they want and need right. uh, kind of conveniently and cheaply. 
Um, so maybe there are communities where they could benefit from services that they just don't have because it's not profitable for businesses to sell to people who don't have any money, right? Um, yeah. But the businesses are always time. secondary. Yeah, I'm sorry. We're at time, and I appreciate you're right. The business should be secondary. They should see themselves as such if they have any. Um, well, if you tell people all their lives so that, that if you tell people all their lives that you are a horrible person who deserves homelessness if you don't want a job, they're all going to tell you, yes, that's what we want. We want jobs. Well, I remember when I did low income organizing work in Arkansas during welfare reform that Clinton pushed in and we were all in a room by ourselves we were able to say these cuts are really painful. And then suddenly in the public forum, some very strong-minded people just couldn't say, you need to keep this up or my families are gonna get hurt. Like uh, admitting they needed this kind of help, which is uh, temporary aid to needy families, right? TANF, um, publicly, I was asking them to do something much harder than what I'd ever asked them to do. The shame was really something. And uh, to a point where I was experienced organizer, but I was really struck. It became an issue we had to plan around. It was really hard. Throwing that out last minute, I want to let people get ready for the next um, session. So I appreciate everybody here. Thank you all so much. And uh, yeah, I will see you all in the next sessions. Hope to hear more. And again, uh, this will be shown again. If anyone else wants to see it, it can be replayed. And there are links you can revisit by clicking the link again. You can go and check out the papers that were referenced in the course of the discussion. I want to thank everybody here and thank you all for the comments. I'm going to look real quick to see if I missed anything. And I'll stick my email on here if for strange reasons you want to contact me. I'm Jason Murphy at elms.edu. And uh, I'll be presenting later as well. Thank you all so much. All right. See you all later. See you all. See you all. I'm off. Yeah, I'll see you all. I'm going to end broadcast a little later if anyone has questions for me. All right. All right. Closing now. Thank you all so much. See you all at the next sessions.